Hello YouTube. In this video we're going to explore the topic of beauty in science. Many scientific theories seem to have aesthetic properties and scientists will often talk not just about evidence and observation and so on but also about the beauty of their theories. General relativity for example is often cited as a particularly beautiful theory. So we're going to ask what exactly is the role of judgments of beauty in scientific theorizing? How do scientists' aesthetic judgments influence the development of science? One view about this, uh, which is probably the common sense view, is that aesthetic judgments are incidental to scientific research. Scientists accept theories on the basis of other reasons, such as empirical adequacy, uh, which is to say the theory is consistent with observations, or novel predictions, so the theory predicts new surprising phenomena, or explanatory scope, so the theory covers a wide range of phenomena, and so on. Uh, and if they consider a theory to be beautiful, this is just a bonus. Theory choice is not based on aesthetic considerations. Some theories are beautiful, some aren't, and that shouldn't make any difference to whether or not a theory is accepted. As I say, I think this is, this is the common sense view. The problem with this common sense view is that it doesn't square with the explicit statements of many scientists. Uh, so aesthetic values do seem to inform theory choice uh, when you look at actual scientists. Just to take some examples, Werner Heisenberg once said, and I quote, if nature leads us to mathematical forms of great simplicity and beauty, we cannot help thinking that they are true and that they reveal a genuine feature of nature. Rosalind Franklin once said that the double helix model of DNA was too beautiful not to be true. Perhaps the most famous example of this is uh, the physicist Paul Dirac. Uh, Dirac even suggested that when evaluating a theory, beauty should be given greater weight than empirical adequacy. Uh, so here are some quotes from James McAllister's article, Dirac and the Aesthetic Evaluation of Theories. Uh, Dirac says, and I quote, it is more important to have beauty in one's equations than to have them fit experiment. It's quite a striking claim. Uh, concerning Einstein's relativity theory, Dirac says, the foundations of the theory are, I believe, stronger than what one would get simply from the support of experimental evidence. The real foundations come from the great beauty of the theory. It is the essential beauty of the theory which I feel is the real reason for believing in it. Uh, and he also said, uh, again I quote, one has great confidence in the theory arising from its great beauty, quite independently of its detailed successes. One has an overpowering belief that its foundations must be correct, quite independent of its agreement with observation. So Dirac is quite explicit that aesthetic factors are, are not just involved in theory evaluation, they're a really important part of theory evaluation. Uh, I should just say, just as a sort of side note, I always find this quite interesting because if you read about Dirac's personality, he was, uh, he, he was sort of a strange guy, he probably had something like Asperger's, and he, he seems like the last person in the world who would care about the beauty of a theory. Uh, he was one of these guys who was sort of very straightforward, he hated poetry, for example. Um, but, but anyway, uh, no, Dirac uh, yeah, obviously cared a lot about beauty and thought that it was really important in theory evaluation. Uh, and, and such sentiments are actually quite common. Uh, so some other scientists who use aesthetic values in scientific reasoning include Pierre Duhem, uh, Henri Poincaré, Ernst, Rutherf Ernest Rutherford, Albert Einstein, Hermann Weyl, John von Neumann, Anthony Zee, and Roger Penrose. Just, just for just some examples, there are plenty of scientists, great scientists, who think that a beautiful theory is more likely to be true. So just as a descriptive fact, then. Um, Aesthetic judgments do often influence theory choice. Of course, the question for us is, what are we to make of this? What could possibly be the justification for this? Now, before we deal with the question of whether or not it's justified for scientists to prefer beautiful theories, it's worth asking, well, what makes a theory beautiful? Um, obviously, there is no official canon of theoretical beauty, but there are certain properties that scientists will tend to cite as making theories beautiful. So first of all, simplicity. A beautiful theory should be a simple theory. And by this, we mean that the theory has just a few fundamental laws, that it has no ad hoc hypotheses, that it keeps the uh, types of, of entities and causes to a minimum. Um, so I mean, this is often associated with Occam's razor, the idea that the theory which makes the fewest assumptions, that postulates the fewest entities should be preferred. Now, simplicity is a very controversial topic among philosophers of science. Uh, for one thing, there are a variety of different forms of simplicity. 
and it's not clear whether they're all of equal importance or whether they all make a theory beautiful. Uh, just for example, there is what we might call qualitative ontological simplicity, which involves postulating a smaller number of natural kinds. So a theory which claims that all things are composed of 10 fundamental particles would have greater qualitative ontological simplicity than a theory which claims that all things are composed of 20 fundamental particles. Another type is common cause explanation, where we attempt to account for various phenomena in terms of common rather than separate causal processes. Another type is simplicity of laws. A theory which has fewer laws with less mathematical sophistication uh, is simpler. Uh, another is simplicity of adjustable parameters. So the theory leaves fewer independent parameters to be determined by data and so on. That's not an exhaustive list. So there's all different, various different kinds of simplicity, which of course makes it a little bit tricky to judge just how simple a theory actually is. Uh, second, there is unity. This is the idea that a theory should accommodate a variety of different phenomena. It should reveal connections between seemingly disparate phenomena. Consider how Newtonian mechanics accommodates the swing of a pendulum, the fall of a stone, the orbits of the planets. Initially, these phenomena are seemingly wholly unrelated, but they're unified by the theory because the theory applies to them all. Or consider how uh, relativity theory further unifies mass and energy into mass energy, while space, time and gravitational forces are unified into space-time, with gravity being nothing more than the uh, variable curvature of space-time. In, in Newtonian mechanics, all of these are separate things. You know, gravity, for example, is treated as a separate force in addition to space and time, uh, but general relativity unifies them. Um, it br bring, brings them, sort of, in, in, it makes them one sort of thing. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, uh, unity is another aspect of, of beauty. Third, there is what's sometimes called harmony. When we consider a great work of art, the parts fit together smoothly. Uh, no element of the work can be changed without substantially affecting the whole. And this is also the case for the laws of scientific theories. Take the law that nothing can exceed the speed of light. If you were to discover particles that could accelerate faster than light, then almost all of physics, from electrodynamics to quantum mechanics to the Big Bang model of the universe, would need to be revised. So our contemporary physical theories kind of fit together in this coherent whole. Just as an artwork isn't simply a collection of images thrown together, so a theory doesn't consist of just a bunch of laws and assumptions thrown together. In both cases, we look for a sort of harmonious order of, of all the parts. Fourth, there is symmetry or invariance. Symmetry in general is to do with how objects remain unchanged under some type of transformation. So, I mean, if you think about something like, you know, reflection symmetry, where an object has the same shape if half of it were reflected in a mirror line, or rotational symmetry, where an object preserves the same shape after a rotation. Um, you know, th those are sort of familiar symmetries, but other types of symmetries are of enormous importance in physics. So, you know, like the fact that the speed of light has is invariant in all reference frames, or the invariance of physical law in two systems moving at constant velocity. Um, a very important principle in physics is uh, Noether's theorem, or Noether's theorem, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name right, I think it's, I think it's Noether's, Noether's or Noether's theorem, um, which states in a slogan that symmetries imply conservation laws. For example, the conservation of momentum follows from symmetry under spatial transformation. There's a good video on YouTube which is called The Most Beautiful Idea in Physics, Noether's Theorem, uh, which is both a nice explanation of this theorem and also a good example of aesthetic judgment in science. Uh, so uh, yes, apparently the person who made that video considers Noether's theorem to be the most beautiful um, and uh, presumably that's because of its, you know, the way it deals with symmetry. Uh, finally, there is what we might call elegance and I'm not sure whether I should really list this as a separate feature that makes a theory beautiful. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to define elegance. This is, this is an aspect of beauty for which it's, it's hard to provide a clear definition. Um, it's, elegance is, is, what is it? It's a matter of it, just some things sort of look pleasing, they look graceful. Um, this is kind of a matter of intuition. Uh, actually, maybe elegance is a restatement of some of the previous properties. You know, maybe it just is a matter of having simplicity and harmony. Um, in fact, 
you, you know, we, we might argue that, that actually some of these properties are not really separate. So you might argue that unity, for example, is just an application, it's just a type of simplicity. Um, so, you, you know, we, we can debate exactly how we should sort of taxonomize the aesthetic properties of theories, but hopefully that gives you some sense of what scientists are talking about when they talk about beauty. So let's now turn to the question of, of the role of beauty in scientific theorizing. Angela, uh, Angela Breitenbach, or Breitenbach, in her article Aesthetics in Science, distinguishes two broad approaches. Um, so, first of all, there is what she calls Pythagoreanism. Pythagoreanism affirms a connection between beauty and truth, and it treats beauty as a guide to truth. Obviously, the name here derives from Pythagoras, who apparently also affirmed that beauty indicates truth. Um, but I'm not really familiar with his, his views, so I you know, can't comment on that, but I assume that's, that's where the name comes from. Um, so, so anyway, so more, more precisely, Pythagoreanism makes two claims. First, that aesthetic judgments are judgments about objective properties. When we're asking whether or not a theory is beautiful, this isn't simply a matter of personal taste. Beauty is an objective property of scientific theories. Or, or at least some scientific theories. You know, the beautiful theories are objectively beautiful. Um, the second claim is that <clears throat> is that theories with positive aesthetic properties, so the beautiful theories, are more likely to be true than those which lack such properties. Beauty is connected with truth. So scientists should search for beautiful theories, and when they evaluate theories, they should prefer the more beautiful one. Beauty is an important factor in theory choice. Now, there are some obvious problems with Pythagoreanism. With respect to the first claim, well, many philosophers will question whether there actually are objective facts about beauty. Um, you know, we might argue that beauty is really a matter of personal taste. Now, certainly, there doesn't seem to be any reliable way to measure the beauty of a theory. I mean, it's not like you can measure beauty in the way that you measure temperature. Uh, judgments of beauty seem to be based much more on, on gut reactions, on intuitions, and they're also very heavily influenced by a person's cultural background. Westerners uh, will have different intuitions about what is beautiful than, than will Chinese people, for example. But the whole point of science is that personal values and cultural values should be put to one side and the theories should be evaluated dispassionately. So this kind of dependence of beauty on, on cultural background is maybe a problem for the, for the Pythagorean view. Uh, furthermore, even if we did have a reliable way to determine theoretical beauty, what reason is there to think that a beautiful theory is more likely to be correct? What could possibly justify this? Uh, I mean, a part of the problem here, part of the problem, is that there seem to be various historical cases where, where the link between beauty and truth has been violated. Theories that were judged to be beautiful turned out to be false. For example, Newtonian mechanics, uh, that was once considered an, a, an exemplar of, of a beautiful theory, but, well, it was replaced, it was displaced by, by, by relativity. Theories that were aesthetically ugly were later accepted. For example, many scientists, including Dirac, found quantum electrodynamics to be very aesthetically unpleasant. Um, but it, you know, it, it continues to be accepted. It, we now think it's true. Um, so, so, I mean, that's part of the problem, that, that when we look uh, at the history of science, you know, we, can, we, we seem to find that, the, that any link between beauty and truth is violated. But the deeper problem is that you know, even, even ignoring the historical record, it's just unclear what connection there could be between beauty and truth. So James McAllister, in his article, Is Beauty a Sign of Truth in Scientific Theories, suggests that many scientists are committed to a metaphysical assumption that the world itself is in some fundamental way beautiful. So scientists should search for beautiful theories because only a beautiful theory could properly capture the beauty of the world. Now, arguably, this metaphysical assumption once made sense, when it was believed that the world was designed by an intelligent, benevolent creator. If you think that the world has been designed by a perfect god, then that does give you some reason to expect that the world might have positive aesthetic qualities in its fundamental operation. Um, of course, this justification no longer works because 
you know, modern science is no longer committed to any uh, theological claims. Um, so it's it really is no not not it's it's not clear what reason there is for thinking prior to empirical investigation that the world works in any particular way that it has any particular uh, aesthetic properties. And there is actually an even deeper problem here. Even if you assume that the world is beautiful, that it that it does have you know beauty at a fundamental level. The problem is that a theory doesn't need to share the aesthetic properties of a phenomenon in order to provide a good description of, the, of a phenomenon. Um, so, uh, I, so to use an example that I read somewhere, and I, I can't remember where, I think this actually was in the McAllister article, although I might be wrong about that. But anyway, the, the, the example that I saw were somewhere, and I've forgotten where, uh, the example was the gravitational field of a, of a point mass has a perfect spherical symmetry. But of course, it would be nonsensical to ask that gravitational theory exhibit spherical symmetry. I mean, what the hell would that even mean, right? So, you know, the the, the beauty of the world doesn't entail the beauty of, of the true theory. The, the aesthetic properties that we find in the world need not be found in the theory. It might even be kind of nonsensical to expect a theory to share the same aesthetic properties as the world. Um, so it, it is very difficult to see how we could sort of draw a connection between beauty and truth in the way that the Pythagorean view requires. So problems such as these suggest an alternative approach, which Breitenbach calls subjectivism. Uh, subjectivism may deny either or both of the Pythagorean claims. So the subjectivist may say that aesthetic judgments have no objective validity in the first place, that you know, whether a theory is beautiful is just a matter of personal taste. Um, or even if they do have objective aesthetic properties, uh, this has no connection to, to truth or justification. There's no reason to think that a beautiful theory is more likely to be true. Um, and, you know, I mean, either, either way, beauty is entirely incidental to proper scientific research. Scientists may find it pleasing if a theory is beautiful, but this shouldn't inform theory choice. The basic problem for subjectivism is how to square this with the attested behaviour of scientists who claim that they do rely on aesthetic considerations. Do we simply convict the, the great scientists like Rutherford, Dirac and Einstein of obvious irrationality? Uh, I mean, it may be that these scientists were just wrong to care about beauty so much, uh, but so many scientists over so many hundreds of years have explicitly appealed to aesthetic values in judging theories. I mean, I, I guess there's a sort of principle of charity that we should apply here, where we shouldn't just assume from the outset that lots of very intelligent people are making an obvious mistake about you know, their own field. Uh, we, should, we should keep an open mind and explore whether there might be some truth in, in what they're saying. So that's what, that's what we're going to do here, is uh, consider some more specific views about the relation between um, beauty and truth that, that sort of doesn't end up uh, convicting great scientists of, of just making an obvious error. Okay, so one view here, which is in line with subjectivism, is uh, the attempt to sort of reinterpret the aesthetic vocabulary of science, scientists. So the, the idea here is that when scientists make claims about beauty, this is really a, a sort of disguised way of making claims about standard theoretical virtues. So this is defended by Cain Todd in the article Unmasking the Truth Behind Beauty. Todd argues that we should be wary of taking scientists' aesthetic judgments at face value. He asks, how do we distinguish genuine aesthetic pleasure from the intellectual satisfaction that one feels when one considers a good theory? And Todd's basic point is, people will often express non-aesthetic satisfaction using pseudo-aesthetic vocabulary. Let's say we're working really hard on some logical problem, it's really tough to crack it, then we figure it out and one of us says, yes, that's beautiful. Okay, we're, we're using aesthetic language here, but that doesn't seem to be a genuine aesthetic judgment. Or let's say that some particularly evil criminal is captured by police. Again, I might say, oh, that's beautiful. Right, they've, they've caught him, that's, that's beautiful. Even though I mean, that, that surely isn't a, a genuinely aesthetic evaluation. I'm not actually making, I'm not, I don't actually believe that it is aesthetically beautiful. The point is that whenever 
a person achieves a goal or, or something happens that promotes their interest, that person will feel satisfaction. And they might use words like beautiful and, and other positive aesthetic words to express that, that satisfaction. So we have to be very careful when appealing to the statements of scientists, because these scientists, when they use words like beautiful, they might not be experiencing a genuinely aesthetic response. So I mean, this is this is what Todd suggests. Todd says, you know, we, we should we should kind of take the um, the aesthetic language of scientists as uh, we should reinterpret it. Uh, so when scientists work with a powerful theory, they will feel intellectual satisfaction, and they will sometimes express this using aesthetic language. Um, but it's not it's not genuinely aesthetic satisfaction. And and notice incidentally that. The properties cited by scientists as aesthetic properties can be interpreted in other ways. So if we take simplicity, scientists say that the simpler theory is the more beautiful. Now let's assume that, that simplicity is a theoretical virtue, that a good theory should be a simple theory in some sense. The question now is, is theoretical simplicity an aesthetic virtue? Well, that's not obvious. I might say that my friend eats simple meals because he tends to eat meals with very few ingredients and he never adds any spices or sauces. In this case, I'm using the concept of simplicity in a purely descriptive way. It has no evaluative content. I mean, I'm not saying that my friend's meals are in any way beautiful. Similarly, we might argue that to attribute simplicity to a theory is not to make any genuinely aesthetic judgment. You know, theoretical simplicity is not the same as aesthetic simplicity, let's say. The theoretical simplicity is not an aesthetic virtue. Um, it's, it's, it's a theoretical virtue because good theories should be simple theories, but it's not an aesthetic virtue. Uh, my own impression is that this is, this is also arguably the case for at least some of the symmetries in physics. So if you think about things like the invariance of the speed of light in a reference frame or the invariance of physical law to spatial location, these symmetries don't strike me as aesthetically valuable really in any way at all. I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm missing something. I, uh, physics isn't a field that I'm, that I know really well, but I, I really struggle to see the aesthetic value of these symmetries. So Todd suggests that uh, beauty is not at all important to scientific reasoning. If a scientist says that a theory should be accepted for its beauty, they're really talking about other properties uh, that are connected with truth in a non-controversial way, you know, properties like empirical adequacy and logical consistency. Now, of course, this view, which attempts to take scientists' statements in a non-literal way, does run into the problem that most cases of pseudo-aesthetic vocabulary occur off the top of one's head, uh, uh, we might say. So when, when something good happens and you say, that's beautiful, uh, that's like an immediate reaction. You haven't put any thought into it. But most of the scientists who talk about the beauty of theories, they have considered the issue very carefully. Uh, and so it would be rather odd if they were just failing to express themselves properly. I mean, given like when you look at the statements that somebody like Paul Dirac has made about Einstein's general relativity, um, it seems difficult to, to sort of reinterpret them uh, as, as being just pseudo aesthetic uh, because it's clearly like he's thought about this very carefully uh, and he does really seem to, to mean it when he's making when he's using these this aesthetic language so if we assume then that scientists are in fact making genuine aesthetic judgments how else might we defend subjectivism well another option is to argue that the reason why scientists care about beauty is that beauty is a useful tool to discover theories there's a classic distinction uh, that's made in philosophy of science between the context of discovery and the context of justification. The context of discovery is about the processes that are involved in generating new hypotheses. The context of justification is about how scientists should go about confirming, verifying, justifying an hypothesis. The point of this distinction is that many philosophers hold that the generation of a new theory, the discovery of a new theory, is not subject to any rational constraints. A theory can come from anywhere. It doesn't matter to the development of science how or why a scientist first proposes a theory. Basically, there is no method of discovery. The scientific method kicks in only in the context of justification, when we ask, what are the reasons to believe this theory? 
So there's nothing particularly controversial in the idea that a scientist might focus on developing a, a, an hypothesis just because it's beautiful. This is the context of discovery. There are no rational constraints. We might suppose then that beauty is important because it works as a kind of motivator for scientists. Theory development is really hard. It takes enormous time and effort in order to develop a theory and to work out its foundations to the point that it's possible to subject it to empirical test. Sometimes it takes you know, decades of difficult conceptual work before a theory is kind of in, in the, the sort of form that it can actually be, that we can derive predictions from it and perform experiments to test it. Now a scientist is more likely to put in this work if she takes aesthetic pleasure in what she's doing, if she finds the theory that she's constructing beautiful. You're much more likely to spend decades working on a beautiful theory than on an ugly one. So on this view, beauty is not relevant to the scientific method, uh, to the context of justification, and it's not open to rational analysis. But it does play an important role in motivating scientists in the context of discovery. And obviously that's an important part of science. I mean, you wouldn't be able to do science if nobody was discovering any new theories. So this is why, uh, even, even though beauty is not an indicator of truth, it is perfectly reasonable for scientists to care about beauty. Beauty is a tool to discover theories. There are a couple of concerns with this view. First of all, uh, well, obviously it rests on the assumption that it doesn't matter how scientists generate theories, that, that all that matters is that some theories are generated which can then be tested. But consider, what if the true theory is actually an ugly theory? Well, in that case, if we're encouraging scientists to focus on developing beautiful theories, that will make them less likely to hit upon the true theory. So we might actually worry that the context of discovery and the context of justification can't be so cleanly separated. If there is a significant bias in the context of discovery, so that there's a class of theories that scientists just aren't exploring properly, that will affect the development of science, because it will mean that there's a, a whole class of theories that aren't being tested. The, the thought, I guess, would be it's only OK for scientists to be biased towards beautiful theories in the context of discovery if we have some reason to think that beauty is linked with truth. Um, because if, you know, if, it's, if it's not linked with truth, then that bias is, is sort of just a bias that's actually going to skew the results of science. So we might think actually the subjectivist really shouldn't uh, accept this, the, the idea that scientists are justified in caring about beauty because beauty is a, is a useful tool. Um, the, the second issue, of course, with this, uh, with this view is that even if uh, there, there is a clear distinction between uh, the contexts of discovery and justification, <clears throat> many scientists seem to explicitly treat beauty as relevant to justification. Um, Paul Dirac thinks that scientists should choose the beautiful theory over the one that has more empirical evidence in its favour. Uh, so that, that, that's clearly a matter of how theories are justified. So we might ask then, how could beauty figure in the context of justification? Is there any way in which this could be reasonable? Well, one possibility is that aesthetic judgments are tiebreakers. So th the thought here is evidence alone cannot tell us what theory we should accept. And one reason for this is underdetermination. For any set of evidence, there will be a variety, indeed an infinity of theories that are compatible with that evidence. To get an intuitive sense of this, uh, if you imagine a set of points on a graph, and you're asked to draw a line through those points. And let's say the points represent observations, the points represent like the bits of evidence, and the line represents the theory. There are a whole bunch of different lines you can draw that will go through these points. And no matter how many points you add to this graph, at least assuming you add a finite number, there will always be an infinite number of different lines consistent with those points. I mean, you can, you can see in, in this graph, the obvious thing to do would be to draw a straight line, but you could draw a wavy line. You could draw, I mean, a line that's just sort of completely crazy that goes all over the graph as long as it goes through those points. In the same way, then, scientists might develop a couple of theories that both agree with all of the evidence. And that actually seems to be the case in, for instance, quantum mechanics, where there are a variety of uh, empirically equivalent theories. We haven't performed any tests that can decide between, say, the Copenhagen interpretation and the many worlds interpretation. Uh, there's just this, there's a whole bunch of different interpretations that are all equally compatible with the evidence. How then do we decide between empirically equivalent theories? Oh, I should say empirically equivalent just means theories that make the theories make the same predictions about the evidence, so they're sort of equally compatible with the evidence. 
Well, uh, perhaps we should just choose the most beautiful. Uh, when evidence alone cannot be used to determine which theory to accept, we should appeal to aesthetic judgments. OK, some difficulties with this idea. First of all, uh, it might be argued that this procedure is simply irrational that if two theories are at present empirically equivalent, then both should be retained until such time as we figure out a way to use experimental evidence to decide between them. And actually, this seems to be what has happened in quantum mechanics. While individual scientists might work on one interpretation or another for aesthetic reasons, I don't know, maybe they find the, the many worlds interpretation more beautiful, so they work on that. Uh, clearly, this has not led to any uh, broad consensus on any particular interpretation. Uh, I mean, certainly the, the alternative interpretations have not yet been rejected. Uh, so uh, within quantum mechanics, scientists have just allowed the various different empirically equivalent interpretations to flourish. A second difficulty with this uh, is that genuine empirical equivalence happens relatively rarely. Uh, in most cases, when scientists disagree about a theory, they're disagreeing about which is the best supported by empirical evidence. And finally, uh, it's, it's clear again that many scientists who appeal to aesthetic judgments do not view them merely as tiebreakers. Um, some scientists take aesthetic judgments to be on par with or even more important than empirical cri criteria. Recall uh, Dirac, uh, Dirac's idea that it's more important to have beauty in one's equations than to have them fit experiment. So clearly beauty is more than just a tiebreaker for, uh, for Dirac at least. There is actually another way to think about underdetermination, though, which is the uh, the, the, the Duhem Quine thesis. Um, I mean, there's well, uh, the, the, there's a lot. This is often taken to be a kind of underdetermination. There's actually a lot of debate about whether this uh, is um, is a type of underdetermination or whether this is just the same as underdetermination. Some people think the Duhem Quine thesis is actually incompatible with underdetermination, but you know, I, I suppose those uh, technical debates don't matter. If, if you're interested in underdetermination, actually. Um, you should check out my video in my Scientific Realism series on underdetermination. I also talk about the de Quine thesis there. Uh, any, anyway, so um, we, we could also appeal to the de Quine thesis as justifying the use of beauty as a, as a, uh, as a standard of theory choice. Uh, James McAllister, in his article uh, Dirac and the Aesthetic Evaluation of Theories, suggests that uh, something like the de Quine thesis was the basis of uh, Dirac's view of theoretical beauty. So basically, uh, the Duhem Quine thesis tells us that scientists are underdetermined in how they should respond to a failed prediction because no hypothesis can ever be tested in isolation. All hypotheses are supported by a variety of auxiliary hypotheses which are used to derive a prediction from the hypothesis. So if the prediction turns out to be false, we can't be sure whether the problem is in the central hypothesis or in one of the auxiliary hypotheses. In the face of a failed prediction, any hypothesis can be retained by altering uh, some of the auxiliary hypotheses. A classic example of this uh, is that it was known throughout the 1800s that the orbit of Mercury deviated slightly from the predictions of Newtonian mechanics. Did this falsify uh, Newton's theory? Well, no. Uh, one of the auxiliary hypotheses that produced this prediction was the assumption that Mercury was the closest planet to the Sun. But if there were a planet closer to the Sun, then this, this mass would exert a gravitational force on Mercury, so producing the deviation in its orbit. So most scientists of the 1800s assumed that there, were, that there was another planet, Vulcan, closer to the Sun than Mercury. Now, of course, uh, the many attempts to detect Vulcan failed. But again, Newtonian mechanics was not taken to be falsified, because instead of a planet, Perhaps the same mass is found in a set of asteroids, each of which uh, would be too small to be visible through the telescopes of the day. So you can see that by altering the auxiliary hypotheses about the distribution of mass in the solar system, Newtonian mechanics could be made compatible with Mercury's orbit. Indeed, with enough creativity, pretty much any hypothesis can be maintained in the face of pretty much any evidence. This is the Duhem Quine thesis. When scientists make an observation, they don't test an hypothesis in isolation, they test a whole web of belief. What this means is that empirical evidence is not decisive in the, evalu in the evaluation of a theory. Empirical evidence is not in itself sufficient to falsify a theory because a failed prediction could be due to a defect in the theory or a defect in one of the auxiliary hypotheses. So when a theory faces a failed prediction, how do scientists respond? Well, 
you know, the evidence alone can't tell them. They can't tell them whether to retain the theory or to accept a different theory. And this, McAllister says, is what leads uh, Dirac to hold that sometimes beauty is more important in theory choice than empirical evidence. As we saw earlier, Dirac judged relativity theory to be correct largely independently of its empirical success. And you know, the, point, the point here is that empirical success isn't sufficient to show that a theory is true, because a false theory can have successful predictions, but furthermore, empirical failure isn't sufficient to show that a theory is false, because the problem might lie in the auxiliaries. Dirac's idea is that when a theory faces a failed prediction, we must consider the aesthetics. An ugly theory with a failed prediction can just be rejected. A beautiful theory with a failed prediction should be preserved in the face of such problems, and scientists should instead search for the mistake by altering the auxiliaries. Basically, scientists should use aesthetic criteria to, to decide whether a failed prediction falsifies the theory or whether it just ca casts doubt on the auxiliaries instead. I mean, one interesting point made by McAllister in his discussion of Dirac is that, you know, that there, there are these many, many reasons why um, so, sort of evidence, empirical evidence, just isn't, isn't decisive. Gathering empirical evidence is extremely difficult. Um, you know, the, the data we've acquired when performing tests may be misleading or wrongly interpreted. Sometimes it's not clear what the evidence actually shows or what kinds of evidence are, are relevant. Uh, it's a very difficult matter to determine whether or not a theory is empirically adequate. On the other hand, it's not so difficult to determine whether a theory is beautiful because beauty is, is it's sort of immediately accessible to us. We just examine a theory and then, you know, we just either have a sort of positive aesthetic reaction or we don't. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a sort of standard of, of theory choice that we can more easily appeal to. Okay, so, so anyway, maybe, maybe something like uh, the, the de Hem-Quine thesis uh, justifies the, the appeal to beauty. Of course, uh, this still leaves the question of, of you know, why, why beauty? What's so special about about beauty. It, it would be possible, for instance, to say that instead of preferring beautiful theories, we should prefer ugly theories. Um, so, you know, when a, when, a fail, when a theory faces a failed prediction, if it's an ugly theory, then, you know, retain it and look for the problems in the auxiliaries. So, again, it, it looks like the problem here is that we just don't have that link between beauty and truth that the sort of Pythagorean view would, would seem to require. Okay, so we've discussed these two major positions, Pythagoreanism and subjectivism, but these do not exhaust the conceptual landscape. There are compromise positions. One alternative, which is defended by James McAllister, is what he calls the aesthetic induction. McAllister denies the first Pythagorean claim that beauty is an objective property of theories, but he holds that there is a sense in which beauty and truth are connected. Well, first of all, then, the, the problem with the Pythagorean view of beauty, according to McAllister, is that the idea of beauty as an objective property uh, just isn't really compatible with the, with the way in which judgments of beauty have changed over time. What we find when we look at the history of science is that judgments of beauty often follow theory acceptance. A theory is first accepted on empirical grounds and then scientists come to see it as beautiful. For example, Kepler's elliptical orbits were initially rejected by many scientists on aesthetic grounds. In Kepler's day, perfectly circular orbits were seen as simpler and more beautiful, as a more uniform system. But over time, we've come to regard the, the mechanics of planetary orbits and as, as an exemplar of simplicity and beauty in theory. Similarly, uh, it used to be the case that visualization was seen as an important component of beauty. So this is the ability to form a picture of what the theory says. But then with the development of quantum mechanics, scientists cared much less about visualization, prefer preferring instead abstract mathematics. Or consider determinism. In classical physics, determinism was taken as conferring beauty to theories. This is the idea of God's perfectly tuned clockwork universe. Many scientists, including Einstein, initially rejected quantum mechanics, partly due to its indeterminism. But then once quantum mechanics was accepted, determinism was no longer aesthetically relevant. Finally, sim uh, symmetry. Uh, we, we mentioned earlier in the video that symmetry is cited as a really important component of beauty in theories, uh, but this didn't used to be the case. Uh, symmetry only became an important aesthetic consideration after the development of Einstein's relativity theory. The point of all of this then is that when we look at history, 
McAllister says, what we find is that it's not that judgments of beauty drive theory acceptance. Rather, the fact that a theory is accepted and it has been well developed and is worked on by scientists, this fact will encourage them to view it as beautiful. So beauty is not an objective property of theories. In many cases, scientists will will consider a theory beautiful. They will have a positive aesthetic response to a theory because it is well confirmed. So um, how then are we to make sense of claims of scientists like Dirac that beauty is a factor in theory choice? Well, this is where McAllister's idea of what he calls the aesthetic induction comes in. McAllister says that although theories may not be objectively beautiful, they do objectively have the aesthetic properties that scientists might judge to be beautiful. For example, the simplicity or symmetry or unifying power of a theory is an objective feature of it. Now, the question then is, well, which, if any, of these aesthetic properties uh, are a sign of, of truth? Which of these properties is connected to truth? And um, perhaps we can know this by induction. Theories have aesthetic properties and historically the successful theories will be you know, will will have tended to ha to be those with certain aesthetic properties and we can come to know which aesthetic properties are connected to truth because some such properties may be correlated with theories that are empirically successful you know so so it's just it's just that we you know we find that successful theories are those with particular aesthetic properties and those are the properties that are uh, that, that are indicative of truth um, so McAllister's idea is that certain theories in a discipline will prove to be highly successful and will become central to all of the work in that discipline. Uh, Newtonian mechanics had a central place in physics for centuries and then later general relativity and quantum mechanics took that, that kind of central place. These really powerful, really successful theories will have particular aesthetic properties. And due to the success of these theories, scientists will then react positively to these aesthetic properties and will search for other theories that exhibit similar properties. As McAllister says, scientists attach aesthetic value to an aesthetic property roughly in proportion to the degree of empirical success scored by the set of theories that exhibit that property. Basically, scientists consider theories beautiful insofar as they resemble the accepted uh, successful theories. McAllister calls this the aesthetic canon. So the aesthetic canon is uh, uh, those aesthetic properties that are judged by scientists to be beautiful. The aesthetic canon is drawn from the aesthetic properties of successful theories. And scientists then use the aesthetic canon as a standard to judge new theories, because those, the, uh, the aesthetic properties of the aesthetic canon have proven to be so successful in, in the past. Um, but now, what about the, the point that McAllister raised that the aesthetic canon seems to change? Uh, that, that what's considered beautiful at one time may not be so important at a later time. Well, here McAllister appeals to the notion of scientific revolutions, associated obviously with Kuhn. Uh, please check out my video on, on Kuhn if you're not familiar with his views. That's uh, Philosophy of Science, Seven Scientific Revolutions. So go, go and you know, watch that if you're not familiar with Kuhn. But anyway, on, on Kuhn's model of science, science develops through periods of normal science, which is puzzle solving guided by a paradigm that all scientists in the field accept, punctuated by revolutions, which occur when unsolved puzzles build up to the point that the paradigm is thrown out and a new one established. McAllister says that during periods of normal science, there tends to be agreement among the scientists within a particular discipline that uh, certain aesthetic properties, such as simplicity or symmetry or whatever, are a sign of truth. So in developing new theories, scientists working in that discipline will focus on theories with, with those properties. Uh, a, a paradigm then on, on McAllister's view includes an aesthetic canon, and the acceptable theories developed under that paradigm have to feature the right aesthetic properties. Sometimes though, only a theory that violates the aesthetic canon will accommodate all of the evidence, and this will prompt a scientific revolution. A scientific revolution occurs when a theory is accepted on purely empirical grounds, even though it's radically different from earlier successful theories in terms of its aesthetic properties, and so is considered aesthetically ugly. Uh, and then once the revolution is complete and the new theory is accepted, the aesthetic canon changes. So the properties considered aesthetically beautiful change and are based on, on the new theory, the, the properties of the new theory. So to take the example of uh, quantum mechanics, as we noted, before the development of quantum mechanics, 
visualizability and determinacy were both considered aesthetically beautiful, and scientists searched for theories that exhibited these properties. But there came a point where such theories just couldn't accommodate the evidence. Quantum mechanics, with its highly abstract mathematics and its indeterminate metaphysics, was initially considered an ugly theory. But then after the quantum revolution, after quantum mechanics achieved these remarkable empirical successes, the aesthetic canon changed. And so you know, these days it includes neither visualizability nor determinacy. <clears throat> but notice that on um, McAllister's view, the resistance to the quantum theory uh, was perfectly rational. Both the supporters like Niels Bohr and the detractors like Einstein of uh, the new theory could claim to be acting rationally. The, the, the supporters like Bohr were impressed by the empirical successes of the theory in accommodating phenomena that were recalcitrant to classical mechanics. Einstein, on the other hand, could point out on the basis of the last several hundred years that, you know, deter <coughs> that determinism and visualization were strongly correlated with empirical success. So we should expect that, that if uh, quantum theory is to continue to be successful, it should develop aesthetic properties more in line with the classical aesthetic canon that has served scientists so well for so long. Now, of course, the detractors were wrong. Um, you know, as, as time went on, quantum theory continued to accumulate massive successes, but it, you know, it didn't change its aesthetic properties. It, it remained indeterminate and highly abstract. Uh, and so scientists simply abandoned their, um, their classical aesthetic canon. OK, let's sum up the, the aesthetic induction procedure. When a theory scores substantial empirical success, its aesthetic properties will be favoured in the aesthetic canon of scientists, which just means that scientists will judge those properties to be beautiful. Uh, then scientists will search for theories with similar properties. Scientists will search for theories that are in line with the aesthetic canon, and, and, and the aesthetic canon will be used as a standard of judgment when evaluating new theories. Of course, if these new theories are also successful, then the aesthetic properties will gain even greater favour. But eventually there may come a point where uh, theories with such properties are just unable to account for various phenomena. Um, so, you know, new theories outside of the aesthetic canon, new theories with different aesthetic properties will be proposed. Uh, once one of these new theories is accepted, the aesthetic canon will change. And, and then going forward, scientists will use the new aesthetic canon as a standard for evaluating uh, new theories. So in this way, by constantly updating our aesthetic canon, we may eventually find the aesthetic properties that are connected with truth, if there are any. I mean, we, we may eventually come up with the correct aesthetic canon. Um, but whether or not there is a correct aesthetic canon, uh, we will always find that uh, judgments of beauty are sort of correlated with uh, empirical success. Uh, now clearly McAllister adopts a subjectivist account insofar as uh, he holds that properties count as beautiful only because they provoke an, a, a positive aesthetic response in scientists. Beauty is not an objective feature of theories. It's an objective fact that a theory contains certain symmetries, say, but whether such symmetries are beautiful is a matter of how a scientist responds when contemplating the theory. However, on McAllister's view, beauty is connected to empirical adequacy. When judgments of beauty diverge from empirical adequacy, a scientific revolution occurs, and this prompts a, a change in, in the aesthetic canon, after which aesthetic criteria are again brought in line with empirical adequacy. Uh, so, um, yeah, so, so, so McAllister's view is, is kind of, as I say, it's maybe a sort of middle way between the Pythagorean and the subjectivist views, um, because he allows that, that beauty does sort of play an important role in science, but not because it's connected with truth in the way that the Pythagorean thinks. Uh, okay, so let's consider another middle way between Pythagoreanism and subjectivism. So Angela Breitenbach, in her article Aesthetics in Science, suggests a view that denies both aspects of Pythagoreanism, but which also allows beauty to play a legitimate role in theory choice. So, so this, this kind of view uh, denies uh, that um, that beauty is an objective property and that beauty is connected with truth, but it still has a kind of role in theory evaluation. For Breitenbach, the key to the justification of aesthetic judgments is that truth is not the only aim of science. Scientists also aim to understand the world. Not just truth, but understanding is important. Now, there's 
a very large literature on the topic of scientific understanding. And we won't go into that in too much detail here, uh, but the important point for Brighton Back is that many people argue that understanding does not require truth. A false theory can promote greater understanding of the world. For example, Newtonian mechanics turned out to be false about the underlying structure of the universe, but to this day it still provides understanding of phenomena within a particular range of masses and velocities. Once a person, understand, once a person grasps Newtonian mechanics, they, they will have a much greater understanding of, for example, the behaviour of the planets in the solar system than will somebody who is ignorant of physics. Or consider the use of idealisations in science, such as uh, the ideal gas. There's no such thing as an ideal gas. No real gas consists of point particles that interact only via perfectly elastic collisions. And yet the ideal gas law promotes understanding of the behaviour of real gases and of thermodynamics more generally. So we can use these false theories to generate understanding. Now, it's a difficult question how exactly false theories promote understanding, but um, you know, one, one idea of what understanding might involve, if it's not simply a matter of knowing the facts, one idea uh, is that understanding partly involves uh, grasping the connections between different ideas, and it partly involves the, the kind of ability to apply an idea to a new problem. We have understanding when we are able uh, to unify various different phenomena under a single conceptual scheme and then extend this scheme to novel cases. And this is what we find when we look at you know, theories like Newtonian mechanics. When we apply the theory to the orbits of the planets and to the bob of a pendulum, we see a connection between two apparently disparate phenomena. And we then might encounter new phenomena like a, a new comet, for example, that can also be fit into the scheme. And, and notice that you know, although Newtonian mechanics is false in terms of its claims about the underlying structure of the universe, we do still think that it reveals certain important connections between phenomena. Um, so understanding involves having ideas that fit together and that, that unify in, in, into a coherent whole. It involves a kind of conceptual uh, coherence. Uh, just as an aside, if you're uh, interested in learning more about this kind of view of scientific understanding, you might want to check out my videos on scientific explanation, particularly my video on the unification model of explanation. Uh, this kind of approach to understanding takes some uh, inspiration from the unification model of, of explanation. Um, okay, so anyway, what does all of this have to do with beauty? Well, Breitenbach's idea is this. Scientists aim not just for theories that are true or theories that are empirically adequate, but also for theories that provide understanding. And when we judge a theory to be beautiful, this is an indicator that we have greater understanding, uh, greater understanding of the world provided by the theory. So beauty does not indicate truth, but it does indicate understanding, and that is important. Breitenbach asks, what, is, what are the conditions under which we judge a theory to be beautiful? And she suggests that aesthetic appreciation of a theory occurs when we become aware of the harmony of our intellectual capacities with the world, of the suitability of a theory for making sense of the world. So if you think about the properties cited by scientists as exemplifying beauty, properties like simplicity, symmetry, unifying power, harmony, these are all properties that make the theory easier to use and that make it applicable to a wider range of phenomena. But notice that that is just what is necessary for understanding. Uh, that's literally exactly what is involved in understanding. We need a theory that is, you know, that is that is easy to use, that's straightforward to apply, and that that you know, applies to a wide range of of different things. If you had like a difficult, complex hodgepodge theory, obviously that well, it wouldn't be beautiful, but it, and it also wouldn't promote understanding. So the properties that we consider beautiful are just those properties that promote understanding. Uh, and so, so Breitenbach says, well, that's basically what, what a judgment of beauty is. When we judge a theory to be beautiful, you know, we feel a theory is beautiful. That happens just when we have understanding provided by the theory. So beauty indicates understanding. It's, it's worth just noting that, uh, just to be clear, that on, on this view, when we judge a theory to be beautiful, we're not responding to the theory just in itself, but also to our own intellectual activities in using the theory. So when using Newtonian mechanics, we realise that we can accommodate a host of apparently diverse phenomena under a, simple, a single simple idea. 
and this is what provokes the positive aesthetic response. And this is one reason why we find the historical pattern that McAllister noticed of you know, theory acceptance often coming before the judgments of beauty. So anyway, the, the, the experience of theoretical beauty is an indication of growing understanding provided by the use of a theory. This doesn't give us any reason to think that the theory is actually true, but regardless of its truth value, the theory allows the scientist to unify phenomena in a simple and harmonious way. So perhaps this approach can resolve the problems of both Pythagoreanism and subjectivism. Contrary to Pythagoreanism, there is no reason to think that beauty is an objective property or that it indicates truth, but it can still play a legitimate role in theory choice because the best theories are those that promote understanding. And when a theory promotes understanding, we find it beautiful. So those scientists like Dirac, who say that beauty should sometimes override empirical evidence, are perhaps not being so irrational. There may be less to be gained from an empirically adequate theory that provides a little understanding than there is from a simple, powerful theory that helps us to understand a range of phenomena, but which suffers a few failed predictions. I mean, it's, 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 perhaps it's you know, the reason why Dirac sort of held this view of general relativity as uh, you know, being acceptable even in the face, even if it did have uh, experimental problems is just because of the incredible understanding provided by that theory, that we should sort of retain it because of what it brings to our understanding of the world. I suppose the obvious test case for, for this kind of view would be quantum mechanics. Um, so as, uh, well, it's, it's sort of a standard kind of slogan, isn't it, that nobody understands quantum mechanics. Uh, the theory is accepted on the basis of its incredible empirical success. If McAllister is right, then quantum mechanics should be considered beautiful, since it should have influenced the aesthetic canon and scientists should be searching for theories with similar properties. It, on the other hand, if Breitenbach is right, then quantum mechanics should still be considered aesthetically ugly because it's not so good at promoting understanding. I'm not entirely sure what the general consensus is among physicists on this matter. Um, though I have to say my, my impression is that relativity is sort of cited as the, the kind of exemplary beautiful theory. You know, I mean, it, it, relativity is perhaps, uh, the, the general consensus is like, that's the most beautiful theory. Quantum mechanics, if it is considered beautiful, is considered to be less beautiful than, than general relativity, despite its comparable empirical success. So maybe that supports Breitenbach's position over McAllister's, I'm not sure. Um, but, 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 but anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's all for now. So thanks for watching. Goodbye.